Dear Thomas Kevin Mangel, distinguished participants, welcome to the 22nd session of the Create Academy Human Rights Talks organized by our institution. First of all, as the moderator of this session, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Asena and I've been working for Human Rights and Equality Institution of Turkey as an assistant expert. I will be with you for moderation of today's session. Uh, with that being said, this esteemed participants, in line with the establishment law of our institution, numbered 6701, our institution has been mandated to raise awareness regarding promotion and protection of human rights and combating discrimination by using mass media. Designed as an education training program in the field of human rights, Create Academic Human Rights Talks is a reflection and practice version of this intention. I would like to share with you the information that these talks will continue on a regular basis. We recommend you to follow Create Academy events from our institution's social media accounts and website. You can also watch this program on our institution's YouTube channel after the live broadcast ends. Today's guest of Create Academy session is Mr. Thomas Kevin Mangat. The topic of our session is Transitional Justice, the Argentine case. We would like to express our gratitude to the esteemed guests for accepting our invitation and participation in the program. Dear participants, first of all, I would like to inform you about the program. In the first part of our event, which is planned to last approximately one hour, we will listen to guest presentation and information. Afterwards, there will be a question and answer part that will last for 15 minutes. We plan to complete our program after listening to guest advice on the transitional justice. And now I would like to mention about Mr. Mangel's background. Mr. Thomas Kevin Mangel has been rostered expert in justice rapid response since May 2023, legal advisor in Ambassador of Argentina and Turkey since 2022. He also served as trainer and consultant in Ministry of Foreign Affairs for three years. From 2013 to 2021, he worked as senior legal officer for Federal Criminal Court of Cassation in Argentina. In addition to those all mentioned above, from 2003 to 2013, he was legal officer of Federal Criminal Court of Argentina. Having delivered conferences, research that has been published in prestige books and our recommended bibliography of the ICC module course on international criminal law, Mr. Mangel is also member of the International Justice Group, Ibero-American Epistemological perspective of justice. Argentinian lecturer has been working as a visiting academician in Ankara University since 2021. At the same time, he has two publications named Responsibility for Genocide According to Responsibility of Superior and Scope and Limitation of the International Terminal, Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. He has also played an important role in coordinating activities and events related to budgets and funding and leads with diplomatic representation and EU UN agencies. As the director of the Department of International Criminal Law, Thomas Kevin Mangel has organized and participated in the delivery of awareness raising and uh, advocacy conferences on pressing human rights issues in Europe. He knows Spanish, Italian, English, French, and Portuguese. Mr. Mangel, I completed my part here, and now the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Asena, for this presentation. I would also like to take the opportunity to thank the Human Rights and Equality Institution of Turkey uh, for giving me the time and the space to speak uh, a little bit about the subject that I found it uh, in extremely interesting, and in particular, in these days that the world is living. So thank you so much. So if it's okay with you, I will share now my presentation with all of you. Okay, I believe you can see the presentation now. So the title of this presentation is Transitional Justice and Mass Violation of Human Rights, the Argentinian Case. In order to speak about a transitional justice, uh, first I would like to explain a little bit what it is international criminal law and actually uh, the most important thing to understand what is international criminal law is to understand the difference between this field of law with the field of, for example, international uh, law and criminal law. The purpose of international criminal law is to protect the most fundamental rights 
of the international community, which are the peace, security, and well-being of the world. Unlike international law, here the main actors of ICL are individuals, unlike international law where the main actors are the states. We will now afterwards explain how this shift from state actors to individual actors took place, in particular after Nuremberg. It's important to understand this field of, of law that because of the importance of these fundamental rights that we were referring to, there's an international interest and universal interest in protecting this, uh, the prosecution of these crimes. This gives place for what is called universal jurisdiction principle. And why is that? Because unlike domestic crimes, which usually they uh, only have an effect in a particular state within the state sovereignty, these kind of crimes, because it's magnitude, because we're speaking about mass atrocity crimes, they have an impact in the whole international community. Why? Because it affects, as we said, the peace, the security and the well-being of the world. And because of this is that there's a special interest of the whole community to investigate these crimes and to fight against impunity to the perpetrators of these crimes. And that is the reason why national jurisdiction cannot be alleged by a state where these crimes have been committed, unlike what happens with a domestic or domestic crimes, where actually the national jurisdiction can be alleged and also the state sovereignty. In these kind of crimes, it's some kind, it's like we would say like, like the wall surrounding the state's territory falls down and gives the space and gives the opportunity to all uh, states of the international community to prosecute and investigate these kind of crimes. Usually we can divide the evolution or the different phases of international criminal law in three different uh, stages. The first one would be by the end of the Second World War with the London Charter, which gave place and the statute of the international criminal uh, tribunals, the international criminal tribunals, the military tribunals of Nuremberg and uh, Tokyo. Why this was a, why they were so important? Because Nuremberg was the first time ever uh, after the London Charter that uh, individuals became actors of international law. Until Nuremberg, only states were actors or subject to international law. With Nuremberg, what happened is that now individuals could be prosecuted uh, by the, because of the commission of international crimes. After new, uh, uh, we won't have time to enter into all these uh, very interesting uh, stages because we would be lacking out of time to speak about the Argentinian case. But it's important to understand that what was the importance of Nuremberg and Tokyo is was that the first time again individuals could be prosecuted because of the Commission of International Crimes, and for this, international military tribunals have been created to prosecute these kind of crimes. Then we have a second stage uh, that took place during the 90s uh, by the uh, creation of the tribunals of Rwanda and uh, former Yugoslavia. These were tribunals uh, created ad hoc. This means uh, created specifically to prosecute the crimes committed in uh, uh, Rwanda and in the Balkans in the in the 90s. And these tribunals were created by the Security Council by a resolution of the Security Council of the United Nations to prosecute the mass atrocity crimes committed in both places. Uh, the, the main difference with Nuremberg, we would say that it's not that the victors uh, states created a tribunal, but it was the international community through a resolution of the Security Council of the United Nations in order to be more like an impartial tribunal unlike Nuremberg that has been criticized now and then is saying that it's just victor's justice and that is the reason why these tribunals we could say they're more per partial because the judges and the prosecutors are not those of the victor's part of a war 
Then we have some kind of a bridge or transition until uh, 1998. This transition took uh, place by the creation of several hybrid tribunals, also known as international internationalized tribunals. Uh, I'm sorry, we could refer here to Lebanon tribunals, uh, Sierra Leona, Cambodia tribunals. We will speak uh, in the next slide about these tribunals. But this was like some kind of bridge until we got to uh, the permanent court we have uh, nowadays, which is an international criminal court that uh, entered into force in 2002 after the required uh, ratification of states by the Rome Statute that uh, was approved in 1998. So these are more or less the three stages of international criminal law. Let's speak very briefly about the hybrid tribunals. One other thing that I would also uh, mention is that in the same way that the idea of the ad hoc tribunals to be like imp impartial uh, tribunals uh, to be more legit, if you want, than the Nuremberg and Tokyo one, the International Criminal Court that uh, it has its seat in, in The Hague, in the Netherlands, uh, again created by the Rome Statute. The Rome Statute, it's a multi, uh, we can say it's like a multilateral treaty uh, with several states, okay? It's not unlike uh, Rwanda and Yugoslavia, Security Council resolution that creates this, but it's the result of a, a agreement between several states of the international community that decided through a multilateral treaty to create such a permanent international criminal tribunal. What's the interesting thing about the hybrid tribunals that we said uh, took more of them have been created during the 90s? What happens is that usually in all territories where mass atrocity crimes takes place, those uh, states do not have the necessary tools to deal with the past atrocity crimes. Most of the time, the domestic legal systems are fragile after the the crimes that took place in a specific territory so there's a need to set up a model of justice uh, in such difficult circumstances again usually after the after a war after a uh, international or uh, internal armed conflict so this idea of having tribunal is that since the state cannot deal uh, by its own to prosecute these crimes requires or request, I'm sorry, request the cooperation of the international uh, community to set up these international, internationalized or hybrid tribunals, which combines some features of international and domestic legal systems. So these tribunals, they have a participation of international judges and prosecutors prosecutors in national process. So you have the impartiality, the independence and expertise in international criminal justice provided by these international experts, judges and prosecutors working side by side with national prosecutors and judges who know more in first hand the atrocities that they have to investigate and they have to deal with. So what it's the hybrid tribunals, it's some kind of the, the outcome of a negotiation or a balance between the domestic authorities willing, yes, to investigate these crimes and they're reluctant to seize sovereignty, like it happened in Rwanda, Yugoslavia, or Nuremberg. But at the same time, we, uh, because of these needs to address the concerns of international uh, justice, it gives also the institutional capacity needed by the domestic authorities with lack of it. So this combination gives uh, the place for this specific type of tribunals that achieve, again, with a combination of domestic and international uh, law and domestic and international actors to prosecute these kind of crimes when they cannot be prosecuted by the territory where these crimes took place. So these are more or less the different venues to prosecute international crimes. Why today we're going to speak about the Argentina case? Okay, it's not only because I, I am Argentinian, but it's because Argentina was the first time in history that international crimes have been prosecuted domestically, yes, without any of these uh, different structures that we spoke. The, it was these crimes committed in Argentina during the 70s 
have not been uh, prosecuted by an international tribunal or by having tribunal or by a tribunal that is created, let's say, by a Security Council a resolution of the United Nations. So before starting about how this happened, let's go back a, a little bit. What were the crimes committed in Argentina and why these crimes took place during this period? First, we need to understand the context of the 70s. You know that the Che Guevara was killed in 1967 in, in Bolivia, and there was a big, uh, the, the, there were uh, in whole Latin America, let's say, there was an important, uh, let's say, a revolution uh, regarding the, 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 the communist ideas in the, in the 60s and in the 70s in all uh, the Latin American country. Obviously, for United States in particular, this was being seen at that moment as an existing threat, obviously, to the capitalism and in particular to the uh, US. So, United Nations pumped money and weapons to armed forces across the region of Latin America in order to increase the power of the military within these states in order to fight these different uh, communists, uh, or, or at least they were seen by communists by the United States. So it provided the necessary means in, uh, to the different militias across the country in order to combat these, uh, the called subversive by the United States. All this that we are referring to on the back of the United States of this plan that it was called Plan Condor, was uh, first investigated by independent uh, journalists, but afterwards it came to light thanks to the uh, 2019 uh, handover of several documents of almost 50,000 pages handed over by the US government of the then President Barack Obama to Argentina that actually uh, stretched some light to what happened in the region in the 70s. So this plan Condor took place basically in Argentina, Chile, Uruguay, Bolivia, Paraguay, Peru, and Ecuador. This is almost four fifths of the uh, American continent. Back then uh, in 75, there was a president called Isabel Perita, uh, Isabel, uh, pardon, uh, Isabel Perón, Isabelita, uh, that was her nickname, Isabelita. Isabelita was the wife of President Perón who uh, died uh, some months uh, before, so uh, Isabelita, as vice president, took over the country, and back then she lost lots of power, she, she didn't have enough power to deal with the situation that Argentina was going through with several uh, and different terrorist groups that emerged as we were speaking um, before. In order, and you can see in the picture, Isabelita, you can see on her left, she's with Macera and Videla, and later on we are going to, uh, you will understand why these names are so important. But they were members of the militia back then, and they were supporting Isabelita in order to fight what was called the enemy of the communism in Argentina. So Isabelita issued a decree, the decree 261 of 1975, which literally said, that it would entrust the army to adopt necessary measures to neutralize and or annihilate the subversion in the province of Tucumán through an operative uh, called Operative in, uh, Independencia. This was a province in the north of Argentina. And in order to fight the, the, the subversion there, she issued this decree entrusting with lots, lots of power to the militia at the same time, meaning that she was losing a lot of power and giving it to the to the army. On 1975, Videla was appointed commander in chief of the army and Videla issued a directive 404 of 1975. In this directive was very important. These were the grounds of what was going to happen next. First, it expressly referred as the, as the Marxist subversive war as the internal enemy that should be uh, annihilated. It also put the intelligence and police under the army 
and afterwards the whole country was divided into five zones and each of them under a commander order. So as you can see by now, the pressing figure at this point was basically disappearing. Under this context, the only thing that could happen back then was the a coup d'etat that took place in 24th March 1976, when it started a process called by the militia process of national reorganization. Actually, this process of national reorganization was nothing else than the commencement, the beginning of the commission of a human rights violation, mass atrocity crimes committed by the militia. There were different juntas, there were three military juntas that took place between 76 and 1982. One of the first things that the militia do, did was to dissolve the parliament. The armed forces were legally competent to hold summary trials and enforce the death penalty. And arbitrary arrests started to in place and forced disappearance started to in place all around the country in a widespread and systematic way. 340 secret detention centers have been located throughout the country where people were being tortured and humiliated. Some of the techniques applied by the militia were techniques learned by the French warfare from Niger and Indochina, and actually there were some French bases also in Argentina during this period. In order to understand what we are speaking about when we speak uh, about these secret detention centers, here you can see one of the most important detention centers, extermination centers, one of them called ESMA. ESMA uh, means Navy School of Mechanics, Escuela Mecánica de la Armada in Spanish. ESMA was a huge, huge land of almost more than 5,000 meters square, located in 16 hectare property in the middle center of the city of Buenos Aires. You will see where it is. So this idea of secret detentions were, we can't say it's secret, because as I said, ESMA in particular was right in the middle of the city, and many people back then have suspicions of what was going on in ESMA. But there were, as we said, hundreds of these detention centers all around the country. In ESMA in particular, 5,000 men and women have been kidnapped, tortured, and disappeared. How they were disappeared, many of them, after being taken to ESMA, where they were, were tortured in order to get some information regarding what some other subversives uh, were hidden after they were uh, being tortured these prisoners were taken into different flights across the rio de la plata the this is the this is the sea that divides the uruguay from argentina and after dragging them in these detention centers they would just throw them uh, from the plane to the river of La Plata. These flights were after, afterwards uh, known as the flights of death, after being tortured, after being dragged while they were uh, on drugs and slept on the plane, they were just being thrown to the river. One particular thing that happened also in ESMA that there are not so many cases in history where crimes against humanity were committed, where systematic uh, attack against po uh, civilian population uh, took place, there was something that uh, has distinguished what happened in Argentina with other cases in history. And I'm referring here to the systematic plan to steal children born in captivity. After giving birth, women, after, and after being tortured, women were being killed and the babies were stolen and given to other uh, families of the army. This system of a uh, plan to steal uh, children born in captivity, uh, uh, they achieved to stole more than 500 uh, babies. And uh, it's also important to remark that up to date, uh, around 300 uh, of these babies that actually nowadays they have more or less my age, they are thir between 39 and 45 years old, have been recovered and their identity uh, has been restored. Well, I was referring to the place where ESMA uh, was set up. Imagine the size that we were referring to 
here you can see two big uh, circles. The big one, that's the size of the ESMA. And the small one, it's the radio, uh, sorry, the River Plate Stadium. This is the stadium where actually in 1978, only two years after the Coupe d'Etat uh, took place, there was a World uh, Cup, soccer World Cup taking place where, as you might know, Argentina was the World Cup champion in 1978. But look at the distance between such an international important sport event was taking place only that's a 10 minutes walk from a detention center to the soccer stadium. So this uh, systematic attack against the civilian population took place from 1976 and 1983. And why until 1983? Well, what happened in 1982, I told you there were three juntas militares. During the third junta militar, where Galtieri was the president back then, the first public demonstration against the dictatorship took place. Why was that? Because obviously after six years of this kind of disappearances, of, of, of the torture, people obviously started to, to talk. The NGO, Madres of Plaza de Mayo, which are the mothers of the kidnapped, tortured and killed children, starting asking the government where the children were, asking for the whereabouts of of their child, first public demonstrations took place in 1982. Also, there was an economic crisis going on. So the combination of all these was the result of all these factors was that the militia was losing its power. And what can one do when they're losing power? Of course, the first thing it came into their mind was the war. And the wars against whom? Against the war against British. Uh, I don't know how uh, familiar you are with the situation of Malvinas Islands, but these Malvinas uh, Islands have been invaded by the British in 1833. So since 1833, these islands were under uh, the control of the British. So this was a great excuse for the militia to say, okay, we can go to war against the British. In which context? In the context that we were referring when they were losing a lot of power. But as you can see in this picture, when Galtieri declared the war against the British, look, all the, all the people in the main square of Buenos Aires supporting again the militia. So it was a political tactical move in order to regain the, the confidence of the Argentinian people to Galtieri. Who were sent to this war? Argentina had no preparation at all for a war this big against the British, even though it was in a territory close to the Argentinian continent. 18 to 20 years old soldiers without any kind of equipment, arms, food or cloth were sent to this point, which is the, one of the southest point of the world, obviously incredibly cold and in the middle of nowhere. The chances of Argentina to win this war were uh, quite, quite low. And how this, uh, what was the outcome of this? that Argentina surrounded on 14th of June of 1982 after 72 days of war. The cost of this war for Argentina was the loss of 650 Argentinians' life and 255 British died as well. Also, tortures were committed by the military against the troops themselves. So the things that these young soldiers, Argentinian soldiers went through was uh, quite, quite devastating. So imagine if the situation for the militia was quite, uh, for the military junta, for the army was quite bad before the war, after losing the war, uh, the military junta was almost done. So this was also the transition towards democracy. One of the things, first things that happened was that Caltieri quit, quitted and Bignone became the fourth and last president of the juntas on June 1982. On February 1983, the chief of the police of the province of Buenos Aires recognized for first time that crimes were committed during this period. Amongst 
all the things that the junta could do the last thing uh, able to do by Bignone was to announce presidential elections for October 1983. But before giving its power, on September 1883, issued a self-amnesty law, the law 2019-24, in order to make sure that the crimes committed by the Junta Militar would not be prosecuted. So elections took place on 13th of October 1983, and the one who won the elections was President Alfonsin. He took seat on 10th of December on 1983, and the first thing he did two days after was to derogate this amnesty law and issue two decrees in order to prosecute the crimes committed not only by the juntas militares, but also uh, by the choice groups uh, the, 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 the crimes committed also by the terrorist groups. On 15th of December of 1983, Alfonsin created the Truth Commission called National Commission on the Disappearance of Persons. You have to also take into consideration that, as I referred to at the beginning, why we're speaking about Argentina, Argentina case. Because when Alfonsin was elected, he was before this huge dilemma whether to try or not to try these kind of crimes because as we refer to as we referred before when transition when mass atrocity crimes are committed then starts a process of transitional justice and there are different mechanisms to uh, go through this process of transitional justice and we can say that individual criminality is not the only solution also some kind of uh, truth commissions, uh, also try to some kind of restorative justice for, for victims. But the idea to try to judge and to convict the perpetrators never happened before as it happened for the first time in the case of Argentina. Another very interesting thing was that not only Argentina tried domestically the international crimes committed within its territory, but that it did it through courts uh, of uh, by civil courts not by martial courts even though in order to respect the principle of natural judge at the beginning these trials were uh, held by martial courts also during uh, alfonsin's presidency they issued a law setting a deadline so in order to make sure that they were going to be partial trials, they gave a deadline to the martial court saying that if you don't prosecute these uh, crimes up to a certain period of time, then we will refer the case to a civil appeals chambers. Actually, what happened obviously was that, that the martial courts did not held independent in investigations or prosecutions. And the case finally on October 1984, uh, passed uh, to uh, a civil appeals uh, chamber. Also, was very important the work done by this truth commission called CONADEP that took testimony of survivors and it proved that there has been 8,1963 enforced disappearances and almost 400 clandestine centers of detentions. With all this, after the case uh, transferred to the civil uh, appeals chamber on October 84, was that one year, less than one year later, on April 1985, the trial began. There you can see uh, the main perpetrators of the juntas militares and the conviction that was rendered on December 1985 were five of them were convicted to life sentence, including Videla and Maceda, for the commission of a crimes against humanity against se, uh, in the in the context of seven and nine cases. I should also mention that uh, these crimes were not categorized uh, categorized at that time as crimes against humanity that happened some years later. But these people were convicted by uh, for the crimes. Uh, that took place uh, during the said period. Regardless uh, how how important this was and how novel uh, 
how a novel uh, solution uh, Alphonsine found and quite brave, uh, uh, honestly, because imagine that by that moment, it was only just one or two years that passed since the Junta Militar lost its power. But imagine still the support that uh, the army had back then. So it was a huge risk for Alphonsine to hold these trials because the possibility of a new coup d'etat against his, its government was uh, very, very high. But what happened after the trials? Then it took place a period, uh, it was called the period of the impunity laws. In December 1986, due to the pressure on the lobby made by the army and the threats of a new coup d'etat, also Alfonsin had to issue this full stop, a full stop, a stop law. The law set a deadline of 60 days for new indictments because Alfonsin said until when we can continue with this amount of trials and uh, suspects with imagine the thousands of perpetrators and thousands of victims and as we said if uh, Argentina could not deal with such amount of, of cases, then there wouldn't be any other option that maybe, for example, holding a, or requesting the international community for some a support in order to hold, for example, a hybrid tribunals or a, no other option that not being able to prosecute. So Alfonsini had to find a balance between what he wished and what was really feasible. And at the same time, not putting into risk the democracy that was uh, recently restored. On 1987, there was a, another attempt of coup d'etat. It was the third attempt of coup d'etat during Alfonsin's government. And because of the huge amount of pressure, pressure by the army, he had to issue another law. It was a due obedience law. It uh, guaranteed immunity to hundreds of military officers below the rank of colonel, who were determined to have been following orders. So this was a presumption, presumption Yuris uh, et de Jure, saying that uh, those who committed crimes committed crimes because they were following the orders of their superiors and therefore it would guarantee the immunity of these soldiers. So uh, with this law, many people were uh, not happy because they wanted everyone who was responsible for this crime to be prosecuted. Because of what happened after this law, and again, of course, uh, again, a very uh, hard economic situation Argentina was going uh, to, Alfonsina had to resign on July. This means six months before his uh, period was uh, supposed to finish. Was uh, in that moment that uh, elections were called uh, in advance and President Menem became the new president of Argentina. And President Menem also uh, issued two impunity laws. One in 1889, it was a pardon law that also granted pardon to almost 400 individuals on trial, military personnel, guerrillas, and also the so-called carapintalas. One year later, he issued a new pardon law to almost 200 convicted for human rights violations, including those convicted in 1985 in the so-called Causa 13. So basically with Menem, the impunity uh, was granted to everyone. In this moment, there was no domestic uh, mechanism left in Argentina uh, to fight uh, impunity. And the only mechanisms against impunity were universal jurisdiction, which is, as we said at the beginning, the possibility to other states to prosecute international crimes, regardless these crimes were committed or not in that territory. Also to hold juicios por la verdad or truth commissions. These would be trials uh, without a conviction in order to understand the whereabouts of the desaparecidos. And also different uh, venues of uh, international agencies for instance, the Inter-American Commission for Human Rights that issued an important report. It was a report 2892. In also uh, this context where Argentina had no tools to fight uh, impunity, a very important case took place in the context of the Inter-American uh, Commission for Human Rights. 
I'm referring here to the Barrios Altos versus Peru uh, sentence of the Inter-American uh, Human uh, Rights uh, Court. I don't want to enter uh, to, to, to this case, uh, but this has to do with the killing of 10 people during the government of Fujimori, who was president uh, back then in, in Peru. And after these crimes were committed, uh, these are crimes that took place in 1992 by the, by the army, by the army of Fujimori, uh, on 1995, Peru issued also law of amnesties in order to grant uh, impunity to the militants that were uh, responsible for these atrocity crimes. At the end, this case in 2001 uh, ended up in the Inter-American Court of Human Rights and the Inter-American Court of Human Rights held that the amnesty for these crimes is inadmissible. Specifically, what the court says was that amnesty provisions, prescription provisions, and the establishment of exclusion of responsibility that seek to prevent the investigation and punishment of those responsible for serious violation of human rights, such as torture, summary, extralegal or arbitrary executions and forced disappearance, are inadmissible. All of them prohibited for violating non-derogable rights recognized by international human rights law. And what are these peremptory norms of general international law, known as use Cogens? These are norms accepted and recognized by the international community of state as a whole, as a norm from which no derogation is permitted. This means that certain uh, crimes that are so, that are affecting the international community cannot be derogated the ones, uh, the law that criminalize these kind of crimes. They reflect and protect fundamental values of the international community, are hierarchically superior to other rules of international law and are universally applicable. It controls and limits the ability of the states to form or alter the international law rules. With this important precedent was that uh, an Argentine a judge, first intern judge, declared null the impunity laws. Why? Because they were going against use Cogan's norms. Two years later, the National Congress of the Argentine Argentine Republic declared impunity laws as new, void, and new. And so you can see there was a first instant judge. You can see also the parliament issuing this kind of law and also the Supreme Court of Argentina with a very important president called Arancibia Clavel in 2004. This decision held that the crimes committed during dictatorship amount to crimes against humanity. It also said that crimes against humanity are imprescriptible. This means that according, sorry, uh, why they were imprescriptible? Because this is, uh, this was according to the Convention on the Non-Applicability of Statutory Limitations to War Crimes and Crimes Against Humanity of 1968. It's saying that there's a convention of 1968 that is saying the statute of limitation do not apply to such atrocity crimes. But it had a procedural obstacle, which was a principle of legality. You know that you cannot that the law you have to it's applicable to the future and not a retro in a retroactive way and also argentina became a signatory of the convention in 1995 and this convention was prior to that this convention was approved in 1968 so you have a legal obstacle but what was the answer of the supreme court to that it was saying that the convention is a use cogens norm this means that when these crimes were committed in 1976, regardless that it was ratified by Argentina in 1995, it was already into force. This was a customary international law, and it was also a use Cohen's norm. Therefore, when the crimes were committed, this convention was already into force and applicable to Argentina, regardless that Argentina 
signed and ratified these conventions many years later. After that, one year later, also an important uh, president of the Supreme Court, it was the Simon decision. It, they said that the punto final and due obedience law were null and void and declared constitutional the law 25-70-79. This was the law that the parliament declared the impunity uh, laws were void and null. So with these uh, important decisions and with this law of the parliament on, the, uh, on 2003, it was possible to reopen the cases in the year 2005. Since then, it's been almost uh, 20 years that the cases have been reopened. There are still ongoing cases in Argentina. Up to date, we can say that more than 1,000 people have been committed, uh, convicted for crimes against humanity. Only 261 have been acquitted. And still we have indicted more than 1,000 with only 20 fugitives and many of them Many of the ones that have been indicted died. Also, one has to take into consideration that we are speaking about crimes that took place in, in the 17th. And you can see that this process takes very long times. And also, this period of impunity law uh, was an important obstacle to prosecute these crimes. So many of them died without being prosecuted. So in order, I think we are almost uh, in time to finish the presentation, but some things that we can we can take into consideration. Well, the first thing and most important one is that uh, this year, 2023, it's going to be 40 years since the democracy was restored in Argentina, since Alfonsín was elected president. So it's been 40 years of in, in uninterrupted democracy in Argentina. Regardless, uh, the brave decision took by Alfonsín well, many things we can we can think about. For example, as we spoke, did Alfonsín jeopardize democracy by prosecuting the Junta Militar, or should have uh, he should have find other uh, other venues of transitional justice and uh, more close to reparative justice and not only punitive justice? Would that have been a uh, possible for Alfonsín, or it would have been more important as Alfonsín did in order to prosecute and convict? the perpetrators of these crimes. And also, these impunity laws issued by Alfonsín, were they necessary to guarantee, guarantee the democracy? Also, what Alfonsín did was preventing the commission of future violations or risking its future commission. One can think about all these things. My personal opinion was that these crimes cannot uh, be unpunished these crimes, these mass atrocity crimes have to be investigated, prosecuted and convicted as Argentina did and also as it uh, referred in the preamble of the Rome Statute that these crimes cannot uh, be unpunished and Argentina, as I said, was the first case in history that international crimes have been prosecuted domestically. So uh, with this, I finish my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm open to any questions. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Manga, you made really informative and attentive presentation. And I guess everyone with us today has benefited from these uh, valuable sharings. Thank you very much for this. Uh, and now if it is okay for you, I want to get the question and answer section. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, Argentina had good examples regarding impl implementation of transitional justice, and could this phenomenon be valid for every country? In another words, uh, at this moment, Myanmar, Sudan, and Mali are being ruled by military juntas. Then we take into consideration of democracy culture and functioning of justice in these countries. Can we foresee the same process for these countries, or do we have to take into account uh, cultural or political uh, design of these countries? Thank you, Asina, for your question. Yes, I think that indeed there's no one model that uh, could be used in all different circumstances. For example, uh, hybrid tribunals we were referring to uh, during my presentation, 
there's also not one specific definition of hybrid tribunal. You have different uh, models to be applied in different contexts, uh, some with majority of international judges, some, some of them applying international law, sometimes some applying also domestic law. So there's not like a formula that can be applied to uh, every case because every case is different, every culture is different, and in particular, every political context is different. So it also uh, depends of the means that a country has to deal with past atrocity crimes with its own domestic tools without uh, requesting the support of international community. Uh, so I think there's, we can't say there's like one formula that can be applied to all cases. Then regarding uh, Myanmar that you were mentioning, uh, we have also taken into consideration that nowadays we have something that we did not have before, which is the International Criminal Court. The International Criminal Court works, ba uh, works based on, a, on the principle of complementarity which means that the main uh, responsibility to protect the civilian population uh, lies on, on, on every state. Every state has uh, the obligation to make sure that these kind of crimes are never committed against uh, its civilian population. And if they are committed, then they should be prosecuted. And only if the state is unable or unwilling to investigate these crimes, then uh, the International Criminal Court can trigger its jurisdiction based on the principle of complementarity. Obviously, depending if the state is party to the wrong statute or not, in which case all of this will depend if there's a referral by the Security Council, which is the only case where the ICC could have jurisdiction on a state that does not, uh, it's a state party uh, to, to the wrong statute. But yes, I, I think that, that, that that's the answer. There are different means. I think the most important thing is that these crimes uh, can, cannot uh, be uh, unpunished. The, it's important that the state prosecute, investigates, and convicts. And if they cannot do it, then the, another international venue should step in in order to make sure these kind of crimes never happens again. And Mr. Mangel, in the name of my institution and the esteemed participants, I want to express our gratitude for your significant contributions and time you spent with us. Uh, and dear participants, thank you for your attention and contributions. Uh, as I said in the beginning of the session, you can follow all the contents and other activities regarding Create Academy on our social media accounts uh, and our YouTube channel. Um, good evening, everyone, and see you again in next talks.